source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. everybody and welcome to Stir in the Cauldron. Tonight my guest is Nicholas Kingsley and Nicholas has been a student of magic for more than 14 years with a focus on wizardry. It can be said that he enjoys the bardic arts and often finds himself telling a tale to anyone who will listen and having grown up with the grimoire of the apprentice wizard as his constant companion he considers himself a true wizard at heart and a child of the teachings endorsed by the Gray School. And in the summer of 2017, he was welcomed into the Grace School of Wizardry faculty at the age of 23, becoming the youngest professor to ever teach at the school. His day-to-day is filled with teaching at the school as professor in the Department of Wizardry, serving fairly well as apprentice to Oberon Zell. The last time he was here, he spoke about wizardry, and tonight we're going to be talking about spells and magic. In addition to talking about spells and magic, we're going to um, ask if you have any questions or comments from the chat room um, about related subjects as well, like wizardry or the gray school or whatever else your mind comes up with cleverly. Um, Just send me a a note, a private message in chat, and we'll get it to Nicholas, and he'll answer all your questions as well. And if you're listening live and listening elsewhere, and have a question, well, you better join us here at paraxradionetwork.com. So, welcome, Nicholas, or, or, or shall I call you provost, prevost? Mm? Tell me. You, you've been, you've been um, uh, elevated. <laughs> That's a bad word, but yeah. Yes. Well, you know, I like to think of myself as elevated, so that's <laughs> certainly good. Yes, provost of the Gray School, it's my distinct honor and privilege to serve our community in this in this role um, of really just bringing the vision of our headmaster to life and executing these sorts of very esoteric goals and organizing the troops, so to speak, and really uh, putting the force of wizardry behind the projects that we're we're working on at the Gray School and and all sorts of things of that nature. So, I mean, all right, you kind of said what a protos, prov, provost is. I'm tripping over my tongue today, something awful. Um, but I had never, I mean, I heard the term, but I didn't know what it meant and, and what you would do um, generally with yeah. that title. Well, as, a, as provost of the school, it puts me as sort of the uh, penultimate authority. So above me is the headmaster and below me is uh, no one because as wizards, <laughs> we're just, we just argue. But uh, in theory, I have some authority uh, to do things, but really all it means is that people have to look when I talk, and then they can argue as opposed to just ignoring. So it's it's a good privilege, certainly, in wizardry. Uh, but I, well, it's important, you know, and for the Gray School, what I do is I help the uh, high deans, the kind of council of administrators in their functions, and I guide the development of the research that we go into our departments with and the mission statements that we use to sort of Uh, direct the curriculum of the school. Um, In addition to this, I sort of tinker around with our website and update bits and pieces here and there, general counseling for apprentices and faculty, and just generally uh, uh, the renaissance man of wizardry for our school and and its needs. Wow. That's a big plate to fill. They have great shoes and a lot on the plate, but they wouldn't have done it if you weren't capable. So there. Well, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So I'm going to jump right in. 
And I'm going to ask you um, what you believe are some of the greatest misconceptions that people have about spell work and magic. And you know there are quite a few out there. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to shake some tables tonight, Miss Brooks. Yay. We're going to okay. we're going to flip the cauldron right over. I tell you. Uh, <laughs> so there's a few things certainly mm-hmm. that I think there are misconceptions in magic, uh, and and this is addressed in uh, Freyder UD's Principles of Five Models of Magic, which we'll talk about in greater depth as we, as we proceed this night into our enchanted uh, conversation, no doubt. But <laughs> I think foremost, the illusion uh, magic taken as reality, I think is important to dispel in that it is not, you can't throw fireballs from your hands or shoot lightning bolts from your eyes. And I've never met anyone who can teleport about, but when... When we find that, I will use it to rob banks, and I'm just going to be honest and open with it. So that <laughs> no one ever tells me how to do it. You've got to know your limitations. <laughs> it's important. But I think these sorts of things, you know, the fantasy magic that we see in movies, mm-hmm. uh, that we read about in books, these are imaginations of the mind. They're very powerful for conveying um, metaphorical meanings or sort of adding spice to an otherwise bland tale. Um, but they are not, I don't think that it's, it's healthy to engage in that as reality. No, but it's a whole lot of fun. And, and, yeah. uh, and it's fun to think about what if, you know, that, so, that's it. Well, like but, I know, said, banks are better beware. So <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, okay, one of the questions that I'm always asked about might be kind of, in a way, problematical because um, someone will say if something is not right. Why can't you just do a spell and fix things? And 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 somebody said that recently about this um, this plague that we're under. Um, but mm. but the thing is, magic is far more than just waving a wand and stirring a cauldron, isn't it? It can be. It should be. <laughs> it can be. Yeah. Well, and you know, I think that. Uh, so I mean, to talk about what's wrong with the statement. Why don't you just, you know, wave a wand and fix it? I mm-hmm. think it requires a, a deeper analysis of sort of the mindset that someone goes into magic with, in that magic subverts the rules of the universe, that it gets to break the the laws of what is and what can be, um, which isn't the case. And when we study occultism in a deeper sense, and we really dive into what the study of magic is, uh, we look at it as we're discovering new or our hidden rules of the universe as opposed to breaking ones we already know. So you don't get to will gravity to make you a bit lighter uh, and help you fly around, these sorts of things. You know, the rules have to remain the same. And so when we look at, you know, the plague, so to speak, this uh, the, corona, the coronavirus, uh, mm-hmm. which is out and about, you know, it's a wicked thing. It really is. Yeah. Um, what we can do with magic is we can shift the probability of things. And that's mm-hmm. certainly very powerful uh, use of magic. Um, but it's it's very difficult, certainly very unlikely, and I'd say highly improbable, to wave your wand and, and stop things you know, from happening. In a world of infinite possibilities, I mean, give it a shot. But, uh, you <laughs> never, know, never say never, yeah. I never say never, give it a go. Uh-huh. But, um, you know, you're exactly right. So it's, it's important mm-hmm. that we, we look at these sorts of things as saying, okay, well... Yes, we do want to work our magic and work our energy and intention towards these sorts of things. Um, but, you know, we can't just wave it away. And um, In fact, one of these things, one of the magical things we can do as wizards, as, as uh, cultists even, or just as generally people at large, you know, to embrace this sort of magical act. Um, you know, my partner and I, we went around the town and we handed out little packages of supplies, you know, some toilet paper, some ramen, some water, some matches and a candle, you know, things like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and on the little card, it says, you know, uh, you know, you no doubt heard about the recent outbreak of COVID-19. And whilst we can't wave a hand to, uh, you know, make it disappear, we thought we might lend a hand with these supplies. And I think it's little acts of magic like that, these little acts of goodness um, that can inspire others to goodness. And it did. You know, other people shared supplies they had with others, and you create community, which is a magic all of its own. And mm-hmm. indeed, uh, you know, it's one of the things that has put uh, humanity into the position it's in now. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I, I would bet we could be a Weasley, right? I mean, you know, having fun and, and doing all that kind of stuff. But we have to be serious here because we are only human. Right. Sadly, but we are only human. So we have certain, li- li- um, not liabilities, but, well, no, sometimes we have those too. But, yeah, it, it's people People totally misunderstand, I think, what, what witches do, what wizards do, um, uh, what we can do and what we can't do. But, I mean, you know, like we said, it sounds really good. Um, but I do have a question from the chat room. Sure, certainly. Who wants to know, what's the difference between a wizard and a warlock? Well, so a warlock is a term, and this, so this again, we're going to start flipping some cauldrons. We're going to say some things <laughs> that some people are not going to agree with, but they are correct. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's, mm-hmm. that may cause some frustration. So a warlock, this is a term that was adopted by television at a point that kind of weeded it into pop culture as the male witch, um, which is not true. But a warlock is a traitor to a coven, someone who sells out their peers to the witch hunters or, or the mob or something like this. So in, in the general term of today, uh, colloquially, it's sort of used to describe someone who's a bit edgy or a bit, you know, whatever mm-hmm. they are. Um, but the way wizards use it, certainly, as we are very keen on the terms, the way, you know, knowing what a thing is is, is powerful. And yeah. so to wizards, if you're termed as a warlock, that's a terrible thing. You know, you, that's not a good thing. And really it is reserved for the most heinous Actions, you know, somebody who betrays the order might be yes, as a, an oath breaker. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. You mm-hmm. know, you might say, well, you you stabbed us in the back. And so you are warlock. This is bad. Uh, now, a wizard, not a warlock. <laughs> <laughs> you might have been a, a wizard who, who became a warlock. And certainly, you know, I don't think anyone can take the title wizard from you except for your community, which bestows it upon you. We talked about that, I think, in a different. Yes. Yes. Show. Mm-hmm. So the the wizard is this is a philosophical um, sort of mindset. This is not a religion. It's not a um, you know. It's not a, a path. It's not. It's not really comparable to witchcraft because you can be a witch who is a wizard, right? So you can practice <laughs> witchcraft. Who you know? And if we go back into kind of the terms of things again, and we kind of avoid. We're, well, we'll delineate witchcraft the religion of wicca from sort of the hedge witchcraft which is more just the application of the the magical traditions and sort of the herb lore and the wise woman of the you know this kind of idea Mm -hmm. Um, so if we kind of separate those two things you can be either of them and also be a wizard because a wizard is this set of rules uh three rules and a philosophical pursuit of service um so the wizard follows three three rules which say the first rule is that a wizard takes responsibility and credit for their actions and deeds. A wizard rep- uh, the second rule is that a wizard understands reputation as power. And the third rule of wizardry is that with great, repu- uh, with great responsibility comes great power. With great power comes great responsibility. Um, mm-hmm. So within these three rules, there's a great deal of interplay. There's a great deal of um, you know, depth. They're very applicable to many different ways. And unlike many rules which tell you you must do this, these are things that say you must be aware of this. Um, so that's kind of the philosophical set of rules and then within that you have service being the uh, underpinning guideline of all wizardry which is that a wizard serves their community yes um so this could be and this is you know this is one of the great cruxes of history because it's put wizards at odds with each other you know, more than anything else because <laughs> you know i may serve a community and you may serve a different one mm-hmm. and they come to odds and you know as wizards will of course try to work things out but as a wizard also you're trying to get the best deal for your <laughs> your team so it can get a bit whatever it is but I oh think, banging so. elbows yes okay well, it can. <laughs> you know, it can but i think which is healthy it's healthy exactly yeah. exactly it breeds mm-hmm. excellence i think in a way and a wizard also understands that and so they shape and guide an event in a, in a circumstance where conflict will arise you know in that sort of way you mm-hmm. want to shape that to minimize any you know lasting pains but if it's going to happen, it should happen in a way that people can learn and grow from and that you can walk away and be like, see where this went wrong and here's where we grow. And, you know, if, if a conflict occurs, you got to be able to shape that into a learning experience or I think you failed in your service. So that, those are the big differences, I think, between a warlock and a wizard. <laughs> well, and you know what? I mean, when you talk about service, mm. I think all of us are here, all of us, well, 
not just pagans, but witches and all, you know, sure. we're here for service. You know, some people are light, light beings. I mean, light beings, light workers. Um, mm-hmm. Some people are out doing good for this and good for that. I think that service is the most important thing of anything that we're doing because we need to, it cannot be selfish. We need to be of service to others. Well, certainly, certainly. And I think when we look at, um, you know, one's value, so this, we're going to look at kind of the, the worth that one can achieve in the world and the, the amount of satisfaction I think you get from these things, which mm-hmm. is often what people look for when they're, when they're seeking out the fantasy magic. They're looking for satisfaction and achievement. Um, that, I think, is, is found in many ways through really finding one's place in the world and finding where we can do the best to our ability. And some people are just geared to be of service to others. Not everyone, right? A yeah. wizard also recognizes there are many roles. Some people are heroes who need to be in the front and raise the shield and stand on high. And when the world is you know, falling apart, they've got to be there. And I get that. Mm-hmm. I support that. I don't yeah. want to be there. I want to be way in the back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, you stay up there and you do good job. Higher with the shield. Good, good. I'll be behind the shield. <laughs> somebody's got to be back You're there. the cheerleader. Yes. Okay. You know, yeah. I inspire heroes. That's a very good job, too. <laughs> yeah. We all have our strengths. <laughs> That's right. Well, and in wizardry, you know, one of the things that the school is really about um, Kind of, you know, I do a lot of stuff at the school, so it comes up in the stuff I do. Mm. But uh, one of the one of the real principles of wizardry is that we are there to build other people up. The real source of power for a wizard, uh, I'm one who employs the philosophy of wizardry, and they engage with that to the point it becomes a vocation. Um, and this is a thing you do. You are a wizard in the same way one is a carpenter who builds great chairs. You now build great communities. And so in that, you find strength and power and connection, and these build into the three rules with the underpinning of, of service allows one to garner a great deal of power and understand that power is meant to be, to be wielded, but also checks that power against the constant consent of their community. Because if the community at any point does not consent of the action of the wizard, whose power is derived from the community, then there's no power. Right? There's only the power that's given to you. Uh, and so I think this is a very important kind of check and balance the whole the whole philosophy. Yeah. But um, you know I think that there's a great deal of satisfaction in helping other people, and regardless of, of you know whatever role you you serve, even the roles of the villains, I think genuinely, and this maybe because I'm you know more on the light side of the force, if you will. But I think <laughs> that there's still a very selfish thing to be done in helping others because it makes you know, a more enjoyable place to live for you. Yes. So you know, if you're out there and you're a nasty person listening, consider altruism as a path to your evil. <laughs> <laughs> and never speaking, speaking of evil, you just ran right into my question, which is wonderful. Um, you know, many people believe that magic is either black or white, mm. light or dark. I mean, I personally believe that magic just is. What are your thoughts on that? Well, well, uh, so that's a good question because... Magic, I think, is a difficult thing to pin down in yes. one grandiose word. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so magic, to me, sort of encompasses a realm of study. So we have, I, I mentioned earlier the five models. Um, so these are models of magic that were theorized in 1991 to kind of just encompass um, the different sorts of beliefs and kind of stick them into these little categories so we can make sense of them a bit easier, as is the human way. Uh, <laughs> so... We've categorized these things, and the models uh, are the spirit model, the, let me see if I can remember all. It's the spirit model, it's the energy model, the psychological model, and the information model. These are the four main models of magic. And I'll talk about the fifth one that's employed by wizards. Uh, so the first model of magic, this, this spirit model, says that uh, when you work magic, the way that you're working magic is actually that you are invoking some sort of entity, some sort of... Uh, energetic construct, be that a ghost or a spirit or whatever you want to call it. Take my class at grade school if you want to learn more. It's taught by a very talented dean, Shadow Fox. We talked about this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the the uh, concept here is that you aren't doing something, but rather you are invoking a thing to do something. Um, mm-hmm. I think a great pop culture kind of explanation of the spirit model is the Thestrals, I think they're called in Harry Potter. Who Love the, the Thestrals, carriage, yes. Right, so you can't see them. People just think, well, the carriages pull themselves. That's magic. Mm-hmm. And it's actually spooky horse ghosts. 
So this is this is skeletal the, the, horses, yeah. Right, but... as you do, as one does. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so this is the spirit model, and in the spirit model, I would say that yeah, you know, you do kind of run into some black and white entities that do manifest themselves as less than positive to the human condition, and then ones that are very uh, in line with the human condition. But there's also a great variancy of gray in between those. Um, you know, if we run into the energy model, which says there's sort of a, a mana or a flow of of chi, if you will, between things, and that this can be manipulated by the human engine, um, and that uh, this also kind of works into resonance and stacking items of power, and these items of power, runes of power, give give rise to sort of an energy that then directs it, uh, the manifestation of will or the you know manipulation of probability. Um, so this is the energy model. In that case, no, I don't I don't think so, because it's just all energy and it's sort of a neutral base energy that then is given intention and direction. And so in this way, the individual who might be an evil individual, there's certainly evil people out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, then yes, the thing they're doing, you'd be like, Oh, well, what's your spell that? Well, I'm trying to murder orphan seals. And you're like, Oh, well, that sounds pretty grim. I think you're probably up to no good. You, you wiser. And so then, you know, that that person, you know, is a ne'er do well. And then the magic they're doing is, is no good. Um, so in that model, no, I'd say that you're kind of probably just working with kind of blank energy. Um, the psychological model, also no. The psychological model is basically placebo magic uh, with, with more oomph, more internal realization and change. Um, it actually developed into uh, the school of psychology and sociology. So that's kind of neat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the information model, super wacky quantum stuff. So nothing in there either. <laughs> we'll get into that, but I just, I'll probably need a drink of water before. Yeah. Quantum <laughs> gives me a headache, but that's all right. Um, yeah. <laughs> I can listen, but, um, yeah, I mean, there are so many aspects of, of things and so many layers and, I mean, we as individuals don't see all the layers. Like, I don't see all your layers. You don't see all of mine, even though we have the same mindset, the same general direction we're working in and stuff. Sure. So it's it's really hard to explain magic, and, and I agree with that. Um, it, it's what you make of it, I think. And, and I mean, we're all different, and, and that's the beauty, too. We can all be who we are. We don't have to follow dogma, and we don't have to you know, uh, salute or, or bow or cur- whatever, you know, we, we do it as bow to a wizard. I mean, you know, that's just good manners, but well, when I see <laughs> one, I will, <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've never been bowed to before, but I'd like to see it start happening. <laughs> I'll give you a virtual well, bow right now. See, well, we're oh, social no. distancing. We're being good sports about it. You know? That's right. Yes, absolutely. We are, yeah. but yeah, it, it's, it's such an, a hard topic to describe, but and I think that's why people get so many uh, misconceptions because, it is, yeah, mm. because it's 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 that you know Hollywood and and books and and movies and all kinds of stuff kind of make it look so much fun and so so wonderful and then at times um, so horrible that people mm. think that. We uh, do all these really nasty things. And I'm not saying that some people don't. Right. Well, it does exist. You it know, does. The things are out there. It's the duality. But, mm. uh, you know, it, it, it's just spell work and and, and magic and, and stuff. And, and not all people that are magical do spell work, for that matter. I mean, well, you know. true. And I think, so. This, I mean, this is a great opportunity. I'm going to just wield this opportunity here. Oh, well. To jump in on these these models uh, and talk about that, because I think what many people, the, the masses, if you will, kind of the laymen, think of magic, they either think of fantasy TV magic or they are exposed to participate in and repeat uh, the psychological model of magic. So, the, I mean, this is really common and it, it is the most prevalent kind of publicly available sort of magic that you're going to come across. Uh, And really what falls into the category of this magic are things like luck spells, um, you know, maybe a a good good work spell, love spells, things like this. 
things where you recite a poem or you look in the mirror or you light a candle, uh, you know, a standard candle. We have to be a bit specific about that, but a standard candle. <laughs> uh, or you burn a note. And many of these things are not working off resonantly based magic. So they're not, um, you know, maybe the original version might be. So if you found some 14th century gr- grimoire that says, you know, it needs to be written on calf's vellum and it's got to be written on this day and it's got to be written in this ink. So then the spell becomes a little bit more energy based. We can look at the ed- <clears throat> pardon me, the energy model and say, okay, well, these things have these energies and when they're put together, they sort of send out a combined energy wave in the same way that you might, you know, see the Doppler effect kind of work on a, on a ambulance that's going past, you know, the waves stack up in the beginning and this manipulates uh, synchronicities. And so that's energy based magic. But what we experience a lot of times in, in the public and when people first come to grade school, certainly in, in many, many traditions, I think when they start on a path, they are experiencing psychological model, uh, model magic. And this is uh, not a bad thing, but I think that people take the psychological model too far. One of the great limitations of the psychological model is that no magic worked in the model can extend past the person working it. So uh, if you do a spell for courage in the psychological model, nothing is giving you courage other than you have unlocked for yourself the ability to be more brave. You've, you've exercised your agency and through the veil of this um, spell or whatever it is that you've worked, you then gain the confidence you need to do the thing. And that is magical, right? Some people write that off as like, well, then that's not real magic. I'm like, no, that's absolutely real magic. And it's very, very important. Um, I think one of the greatest examples of psychological magic that has ever been written about ever is Excalibur and the Sword mm-hmm. of Stone, which, you know, spoilers, was probably like a regular sword. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> magical about it. It's just a sword. But it's the story of the sword and the way people treated the sword that made it something else. And then you know, through, you know, some crafty old man shenanigans, you wind up with a king. But, uh, <laughs> you know, what we look at there when we look at enchanted relics of this variety in this model, because we could also talk about the spiritual model for enchantment, but we'll get there, I'm sure. But in the psychological model, the person believes the thing to be what it is. And that genuine belief has, uh, you know, amazing impact on the human mind, which is a very powerful organ of creation. I mean, look around you right now. You know, what we're talking on is the product of human ingenuity. So when we put our mind to something, we really can achieve miraculous things. And the psychological model gives us sort of a shortcut bridge to doing these things for ourselves. So it's really, it's really something else. Um, and that magic, right, that's out there like that, I think is a very acceptable, <laughs> I'm a little, I'm going to be a little academic here. I think that's a very good version of magic to give out to the, to the masses because it's very safe. Uh, you know, you don't have to do much with it, nothing, you're not calling out to the beasties of the void for favors or whatever it may be. You know, you're, you're really working with that internal cosmos that we all have inside of us, that inner divinity, and you're calling that forth and you're saying, look, I need to be more brave, or I want this love spell to work, or whatever it is. And these little things give you the confidence or the might or whatever it may be to change the world in very uh, significant ways. And realizing yourself, or realizing sort of that internal cosmos by exercising uh, your agency, by employing your will to kind of bring these ma- bring these things forth and manifest them, I think that's very powerful magic. So I don't want to discount the psychological model or the spells or things that are written in it. I think it's very important. Um, but it's not what I think when people think of real magic and, you know, air quotes around that, uh, they get really wrapped up in kind of the very deep fantasy that some people can can fall into mm-hmm. under the psychological model. So you get people who kind of fall so deeply into the model that they lose touch with uh, reality. And it's called we, we express this concept as mage burn, which is where you've <laughs> kind of gone so far that you can't really relate back to the, the world and the people around you in, a, in an appropriate, socially acceptable way. It does happen. And I think when you study occultism or anything that's kind of on the fringe, you run into a danger of saying, well, you know, what's real and what's not real. So peer review, all that sort of stuff is important. But mm-hmm. that's because I, I teach a class and stuff, and we like peer review. We think that's, we think that's important. Yes, it is. And, and somebody, we're going to go to break in a minute, but, but uh, someone in chat, Taz said, I believe... In order for any spell to be affected, you have to know how to raise and work with the energy around you. And that's a very valid point. 
That would be the second model of magic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's All right. It. Well, yeah. hang, hang on to that second model because we are going to take a break, give everybody a chance to stretch their legs and grab a quick snack or whatever, and we'll be back in two short minutes. Don't go away. There's more Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks right after these important messages. Rat! Rat! Where are you going? I'm going back to the paranormal view, back where I belong. Please, please take me with you. No, I'm through with everything here. I want to see if there's something left in life I haven't explored. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Rhett. Rhett, don't run to them. They talk about ghosts and hauntings, UFOs and all kind of supernatural scary stuff. You'll never understand, will you, Scarlet? No. Well, that's your misfortune. Rhett. 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 Rhett, if you go, where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear. Line. Oh, you got to be kidding. That's the Paranormal View with your host, Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, and Barbara Duncan. Every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the Para-X Radio Network. Hey, everyone. It's Marla. If you like tonight's episode of Stirring the Cauldron and the archive podcast as well, take a look at the show's YouTube channel and check out the dozens of shows that are there just waiting to be heard. New shows are added each week, and while you're there, why not subscribe? It's free. And if you click on that tiny little bell icon at the top of the page, you'll be notified when new shows are available. Just go to YouTube.com and then type in Stirring the Cauldron Pair X and the link will appear. Just like magic. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Yes, welcome back and thanks for sticking around. And for your late comers, my guest tonight is Provost, Wizard, and Professor Nicholas Kingsley. And we're talking about spells and magic and answering chat room questions as well. And as we just uh, went to break, we were talking about the models and you were just about to say something brilliant. So go for yes. it. <laughs> well, it was probably the most brilliant thing I, I've ever thought of. Unfortunately, that thought has slipped, but I'll come up with the second thing, which is probably the second most <laughs> thing I've ever thought of. So, whatever that other thing was, lost to history. But this new thing, uh, the raising of energy. So this energy work magic, right? As I believe it was the, mm-hmm. the comment that uh, in order to work magic effectively, mm-hmm. you've got to know how to raise and use energy. Yes. Absolutely. That's a very valid form of magic. This is, of course, our second model, which deals with the kind of ebb and flow of energy and the, the stacking of resonances and the way things kind of interconnect and work together. And so, again, when we talk about magic, we're really talking about these these very distinct kind of ways that we interact with the world through sort of I don't want to say supernatural means because it's not supernatural. It's very natural. It's just in a way that we don't really uh, consider very often, or at least in the in kind of the mundane sphere, if you'll excuse the term. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of interaction with the world is not really looked at, but we have numerous examples of people who use and raise energy and kind of manipulate their sort of life circumstance into very impressive ways. You know, people get you know, their their job or their new car or whatever it is, by really putting that energy forth and, and working with uh, probability. That doesn't work every time, of course. You've got to have a good chance, and then you can kind of push it over the edge with the uh, the energetic push that kind of comes from of spell work and the raising of energies. Um, it's very interesting stuff, and I think that it's often confused with the spirit model and the way they kind of inter- intercorrect or, or interact there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, just looking at a question from chat room about wizards. Um, do, okay. wizard, do wizards have covens? They could, if they're witches. I mean, like I said, you know, a wizard is a, is a vocation. It's a job, so to speak. And it's a philosophical sort of pursuit. So in the same way that, you know, your carp I don't know if there are carpenter covens. There are certainly carpenter guilds. 
And some wizards out there, there are groups of wizards who sort of band together after graduating from grade school and they do their thing and they kind of, you know, worked in a community together. Um, but the kind of purpose of a coven is the, is the kind of flow of energy that kind of happens between the people in it and this very safe, um, area for, for exploration of the craft. And then I also believe that, you know, if we're looking at traditional witchcraft and the, the three coven, you know, and the representative forces of, of the, um, people involved. But that same kind of connection and energy raising and and um, involvement that one might get from a coven, I think a wizard experiences a very similar sort of closeness with their community, or they seem to emulate that closeness with every member of their community. Um, so for me, that's my neighbors, and it's also the people who are on my Facebook or my school or, uh, you know, all these sorts of things. Um and that is in the sense that I belong to the school, not that I own the school. Just to clarify. The school <laughs> owns you, not it body does. and soul. But it does, because you're very busy there. <laughs> oh, I <yeah>. am. <laughs> but I think that when one gives themselves to a cause, you can embody its goals appropriately. Uh, not everyone, that's not everyone's uh, cup of tea, per se. You know, Not everyone wants to be provost of the grade school or you know, only do uh, teaching of wizardry, whatever else it may be. But, uh, you know, that's the path I've chosen for life. And it's certainly been interesting thus far. Yes, it has. And so much more to come that you don't even think about yet. Hopefully. But, yeah, it will. <laughs> Hopefully. Trust me, trust me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, speaking of school, I went over there to the Facebook page um, today. And I saw a video that you did mentioning that um, and this is very timely, that there are online courses that you're offering for free that relate to the pandemic. Yes. So can we first uh, talk just a bit about the Gray School for those who may not be familiar with it, and then let's talk about those courses that are being sure. offered. Yeah, right. Well, that's a very good point you brought up there. Uh, so the Gray School is a uh, school of wizardry. We focus on teaching the philosophical pursuits of the wizard, and you sort of walk the path of apprentice and you apprentice into wizardry in the sort of the old sense, in the same way one might apprentice into the role of blacksmith or carpenter or mechanic. Uh, you can now apprentice into wizardry and walk that path. Um, you know, if you're 11 or up, the path is open to you. Uh, and many, many people walk many different kind of experiences before the path of wizardry opens to them. Some of them start out with wizardry. Some of them have been shaman for 50 years and they come to wizardry then. So, you know, it's certainly very open in that way. It follows the three rules which we talked about. And uh, we, we dive into 16 different departments of study which cover things from, you know, defense against the dark arts where we explore, um, you know, the things that go bump in the night. And, the, mm -hmm. and just many things that I think uh, are misconstrued in pop culture. They're kind of looked at in a certain way. And when the truth of the of the beastie is revealed, I, I believe that there's genuinely a touch more to be afraid of when you know the truth of them because, you know, there's no more like, oh, well, that thing's made up. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it, it may not look like we've always thought it looks or it may not be that way, but there's many things that, you know, hide out in the dark of the woods in Finland and other places that, you know, you don't want to meet in a dark, scary place. So I think that that's, that's important. We teach about that. We teach uh, beast mastery, which goes over all sorts of things, animal care and animal husbandry, and how to you know kind of build up a relationship with wild animals and these sorts of things. We have life ways, which is like beast mastery for people, which is very useful. <laughs> yes. Certainly helpful in the world today, where so many people don't know how to talk to each other. Life ways is, is, a, is a boon and a blessing. Uh, you know, we have many departments. Work cutting, of course, spellcraft in our in our magical practice. Wizardry is the department which covers, you know, our introductions and some philosophies. The models of magic, you know, these cornerstones that are really going to help an individual uh, identify with and employ the philosophies of uh, the wizard. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, these are, are things I encourage people to go to www.grayschool.com and go ahead and look at uh, our website there. The handbook for our apprentices is actually open to everybody. So you can kind of look through the rules and things before you enroll, which is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So these classes though, so that's the great, yes. these classes that, that we put out, I uh, had talked with the headmaster 
we had a great conversation where he was telling me that he was being very wise and very responsible and staying home. And he needed no convincing at all, I'll say. <laughs> and he was completely on that by his own accord. <clears throat> and he, you know, in his wisdom, he decided to stay home from his events and gatherings to help fight the spread of the virus. And as we were talking, he said, you know, it would be really great if we could, if we could do something to help, help with this pandemic. And we talked about a few things, you know, a spell led by the school and this sort of thing. And uh, whilst I did talk it over with our dean of curriculum, who is also our dean of ceremonial magic, uh, there's just a lot, of, a lot of variables in the spell that, that big, and it's hard to be specific with the intention and things like that. So we didn't want to do that, but we did want to contribute in a meaningful way to what's going on. And we got together and he said, you know, we need to put out some information to help people because that's what wizards do. I said, yeah, I like that. So I met with our dean of healing and our dean of work cutting. I said, can you guys go through your departments and find me a list of classes you believe are relevant and pertinent to the current climate? You know, this was a little bit before uh, everything went, you know, to heck in a handbasket. Right. <laughs> uh, this, is, this was prior madness. And they said, yes, absolutely, you know, we're on it. So they both did a really excellent job in looking over the departments, really giving it a solid amount of thought to what they were going to recommend. And they gave me these lists. And then with our Dina curriculum, I looked over the classes and I picked one out of healing and one out of work cutting to offer. And so we offer uh, these two classes for free because we, we believe that they're going to help people in this time. So the first one from our healing department is about dealing with stress management and kind of coping with a busy life. Uh, there's a lot of techniques in there to deal with um, stress and anxiety and worry. And I think that's very helpful, especially where a lot of people are at home. Uh, you know, mental health is such a big issue, and it's something that really affects um, the occult community, certainly. So I want people to make sure that they're, they're in good mental health and they're ma making sure they're taking care of themselves. Um, and that class, I think, is going to be very helpful to people who may feel very anxious being at home all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, so very important. Um, now, the other class is a war cutting class, which is safety and herb use, which is a class that we've had at grade school for a long time. It's been added on by many instructors and professors and deans and really shaped into a very uh, formative class for grade school apprentices who are following the path of war cutting. It's, it's actually a requirement for that department. So this is cornerstone stuff of the school. And I chose the class because there are going to be a lot of people out there who have all sorts of remedies to the coronavirus. Right? They're going to come mm. up with all sorts of different things to drink <laughs> and snort and smoke and mm. eat. And, you know, it's the way. And in a time of panic, you know, people are going to come up with a bunch of interesting things, sometimes out of uh, a darkness, sometimes yep. out of a light. Mm -hmm. But I wanted people to be safe, and I thought that this class, which really goes over how to use herbs safely, how to research, how to you know access that that realm and still be safe, um, and since it's good enough for our apprentices that that we you know trust that after taking this class, they're going to employ responsibility, that they're going to exercise their agency and really be responsible for themselves. Of course, a rule of wizardry, so we do expect that. <laughs> Then, then I thought this is going to be a great class for the public that we can say, look, you don't get the, the assignments out of the class. You do get all the lessons, though. And you can say, okay, you know, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to read these. Um, there's no strings attached. You don't have to sign up to the school. You don't have to give us any, any you know, nothing. It, they're mm -hmm. just for free on our Gray Matters website um, as our contribution to the fight. And I think that it is a fight. Um, you know, we're dealing with something here that... And where – now, I don't want to, you know, fear monger or, or anything like that. But I do want to say that it is a very serious thing that we're dealing with. We've got uh, – you know, we've had some fumbles in dealing with it. We've had some successes. I think I've remained very bipartisan in all my dealings thus far. I'm going to stay there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that there were some moments recently where I, I wish more had been done. And there were some moments where I was like, oh, that was pretty good. You know, it's not too shabby. But the biggest thing that we can do is not going to come from government. It's not going to be a government response. It's a citizen's response. And one of the great magics that we, we really embrace as wizards, and I, I've said it a few times during the show, is agency and employing that agency and really, really 
uh, embodying our role in the world and stepping fully into what it means to be alive and, and really just kind of taking on the full responsibility of you and then managing that piece in the game of life. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in citizenry, um, this is, uh, I'm speaking to the Western, you know, kind of world right now and other places in the world. This is not a responsibility of the citizenry. Um, and, and that's a whole other thing. But I think in, in America and, you know, the UK and, and, in parts of Europe, things like this, the citizen, I think, has a, a very powerful magic in that they employ um, their own responsibility of well-keeping their community, you know, watching after each other and making sure that each other are held to account in, in good form. And, you know, the social distancing business, like we're doing here on this interview, I think mm-hmm. is great. I saw it at the store when we went to go get supplies for people, you know. They have yeah. the tape in the ground. It's good form. Don't sneeze in people's mouths, people, and we'll be fine. You know, <laughs> stop coughing on each other, guys. Honestly. Yeah, wear your masks. Wear your uh, masks. Wear a scarf. You know, <laughs> be be productive. Yes, we do. We need to be. Um, got a couple questions I want to get to, okay. and I'm trying to figure out some of them. Um, okay, so the question is. Um, um, can a witch or a wizard or whoever's doing spell work, um, what can they do to give a great boost to a spell or some type of magic? And, um, you know, you're going to do a spell that's extremely important. Now, I have one a one-word answer for that, but um, the question is, how do you boost your efforts? So I'll well, throw that at you. Well, well, depends, depends on what we're doing. What we're working. So this is the thing. Magic is a very complex, convoluted beastie. And mm-hmm. many of us work in many different forms. So let's say, for example, you are an individual who's invoking a spiritual presence to aid you in your workings. And uh, you know, this is a this is a common practice of magic uh, through prayer or through offering mm-hmm. or through invocation. So if you are working through the spiritual model then I would suggest to give the best results is that you are as authentic as you are comfortable with. <laughs> that's, that's what I'll say to that because there's some things, the, you know, you, you dig backwards through remorse and stuff and you find stuff that I'm not comfortable with anymore. You know, human hearts and such. You're like, oh, well, that's a bit grim. Can't do that. That'll land you, that'll land you in a skippy, that will. So you don't want to do that. But, you know, you do want – so if the, if the ritual calls for brass and maiden spun silk, get brass and maiden spun silk. Go authentic. Be authentic with what you're doing because that magic is resonancy-based. It's based on the, you know, the likes of the god that you're working with or the spirit. And they're not – they don't like the object because it's shiny. They like the way it feels or the energy it gives off. So you don't want to, you know, be like, well, I used a yellow candle. It said it had to be a yellow tallow candle, but I used a yellow Walmart candle, and uh, it didn't mm-hmm, work. Mm-hmm. Well, because the yellow Walmart candle is not the same thing. You know, it doesn't right. have the same kind of feel. So that's what I say for that. You're working with the psychological model. Believe in yourself. Intention, super important. There you go. That was my yeah. word. I yeah, was say hyper intent. important. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to do with the self or through the internal self as the cosmo- as the mechanism for, for activation Mm-hmm. Intention is super important. Yes, um, it is. And in fact, it, it's actually a relevant factor of all magic. It just, it's an, ugh, it gets really spicy in the way we have to define it in different sorts. So we'll leave that to the side for now, but it's certainly in the psychological model very important. Yes. You're working in the uh, energy model. You want to go, again, authentic, you know, genuine crystals, not glass. Mm-hmm. Things like this. It gets expensive, right? Magic, you know, the deep occultism stuff was was pioneered by people who were being propped up by kings. So a lot, you know, it's like I need <laughs> gold and diamond dust. And you're like, well, that's out of my budget. I can't do that. Yeah. Then, you know, unfortunately, and this is the controversial bit, that you know, many people will be like, well, so long as you believe in it, it'll be just as good. It won't be. It will not be bad, but it's not going to be the same as it would be if you, you know, were doing all the bids. Uh, as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the quantum stuff, gosh, I don't even know. You've really just got to know it well enough to be able to plot the entire course kind of mentally and then write that out very detailed and kind of set it that way. 
Yeah, bang your head a little bit in the process. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. Really yeah. digging into that's a nightmare and a half. But quantum will do that for sure. Um, we've got a department, you know, mathematics. It's the darkest of arts, but you know, uh, soul is twisted and evil, and you can find satisfaction there <laughs> in the realms of math. As they say, more power to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I've got another question about spell work. Um, she'd like to know: Is there timing with? Is there timing with spells? I mean, how long would it? How long do they last, or how long do they take to kick in? And I know what you're going to say. I bet I do. Go ahead. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. It depends on what you're doing. I mean, um, I mean, there have been spells that have been active for thousands of years. Like this. Is it now? Okay. No, wait a minute. Okay, I'm interrupting. Being rude, but if they're um, active for a thousand of years, do you? put that in the spell as you cast it uh maybe could do could do wasn't around and i can't really say if spells last a thousand years <laughs> well as like an that. example i mean yeah. we, we know we have to be pretty precise when we do spell work mm -hmm. and 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 not leave things ambiguous here and there so i would think that if a spell lasted a thousand years somebody would say you know in that spell this is going to last not in these words this is going to last for eternity or you know uh, a week from tuesday let's cut it off you know well, what i mean that's, i'm a big fan of the tuesday spell myself but yes. uh <laughs> so <laughs> again models right magic is a broad mm -hmm. concept a lot of different ways so if we're working with physical objects right so this is the energy model really that we're working off of here mm -hmm. then the, the the permanency of the object you're manipulating so let's say you're building a pyramid or a sphinx mm -hmm. or a big copper wire or a stone hand or whatever it is Mm -hmm. uh, the, as long as that lasts, then some some connection to the intention that was there when you built it will, will exist. It will wane over time because it, it lacks direction as things go on, right? Because people don't remember what it is or the rights aren't observed or, you know, whatever it is that you use to fuel the energy that's going into it. So, my goodness, let's say, let's say you build a big spell circle. And it's a Stonehenge-like construct, right? It's arranged in a certain way. The energy flows to the stones, to the center, and this is uh, where you 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 know you use this kind of combinated, uh, packed-up energy flow to direct change in accordance with your will. Um, and this is a big sort of focus, but energy still needs to be poured in or utilized in some way, uh, mm -hmm. because again, we can't break the rules. Of the universe, so you can't just create things from nothing. It can't be constant. You've got to be able to fuel it in some way or another. Um, so let's say you have sacrifices of the old druid sites or something like this. Well, when the sacrifices stop coming, then it, you know, the thing that happened will stop happening because there's no longer fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, then you run into other things where we look at like this. That's more the spiritual model, I'll actually. Say. That's that's definitely more spiritual. I think when we worked with energy-based stuff. I'll retract everything I just said. Everything I just said, apply that to the spirit model. The energy model, I think you could set up an infinite kind of system so long as the materials remain constant. So a crystal grid, a large-scale crystal grid, which just you know works based mm -hmm. on the crystals and such. Yeah. Um, you know, so those sorts of things are very important. But when it comes to the very human magics, where your intention or your will or some sort of instruction must be given. You have to have a record of that instruction present in some way, or it just can't persist because there's nothing to continue the kind of the information flow to the work. Um, so, you know, you might write that down in stone. You might have uh, a rune stone. You know, in Norway, they have these big stones that guard, you know, sacred spots or the, um, I mean, even a, a way simpler version, uh, and not in, a, not in a nasty way or anything like that, is the. Oh goodness! I'm going to butcher the the Anuksuk, which is mm -hmm. a um, it's a tower of stone stacked to kind of resemble a man that the Inuit people would use to protect against the Nanook, or the it, uh, sort of a polar bear spirit that would kill you and eat you in the snow. Which oh, were actual polar bears? To be <laughs> honest with you, they are probably just legit polar bears that were getting people. But, uh, the Anuksuk seem to do pretty well against the Nanook. And these are just little men kind of wards, but their intention, kind of the purpose of them is to be representative of a man, you know, a little, a little scarecrow, essentially. Mm -hmm. 
And so they are a self-contained message in that way, and they get to persist a lot longer. Um, and even at some places, you know, energy-wise, you walk into these old temples and things, which are constructed, and even the old churches, you know, yeah. follow the same rules because they understood at the time, you know, these are sites of power, and so that power has to be captured, build the building this way, da da da. But you walk in and you go, oh no, I feel the energy mm-hmm. of the space. You do. It's, you know, yes. energy model stuff. Maybe a little skirt in there too, a little dash of that. But I couldn't yeah. say. But it feels good. I mean, sometimes to walk into some place and feel the energy, I think, is such a blessing, even if it's bad, because you're experiencing something that maybe you haven't before, or maybe somebody else won't. And I, I think being open enough to do that is is kind of marvelous. I think so. I think you know, it's a. I believe that people are innately in tune with a lot of the magics that we we explore. They just kind of shut down the sensory bits of their brain as you go through life. Because I think if we were to really appreciate the true majesty of the world, we'd walk around with our mouths open all the time. So you've got to ignore some of the miraculous stuff just to make it through the day. So the uh, <laughs> the the kind of approach I think to recognize the energy in a space. Um, and you know, I've been to sort of sacred sites where you. There is not it's a it's not a good feeling per se, but it's an right. it's a sense that there is a something in the air, you know, a yes. bit thicker, a bit a bit uh, more alive, more vivid, so that's there. And mm-hmm. these sorts of things, uh, I mean, that's that's that compounding of energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're getting, you know, if you're gonna get real fancy with it. You build a place for yourself that is an energetic. You know, stones and wood, and you mm-hmm. kind of set up a cauldron, and you build a ritual space, and this creates an energy source, and then you invoke a deity or a spirit, and you turn it into a shrine. And so, shrines are quite potent, and that they combine two of the models into a very effective uh, kind of way. So, to the person's question, <laughs> how do you boost your juice, if you will? Uh, you know, if you're working That's... energetic or spiritual, make a shrine. Yes, that sounds good. All right, we're running out of time quickly. Um, I want you to give out the um, website again Mm. um, so people can go, especially those who might want to take those two courses that are free and kind of, you know, do a little healing, do a little whatever. So Mm. go ahead. All right, well, our website is www.grayschool.com. It's G-R-E-Y, in case you're English. And uh, it'll redirect you to gswhandbook.com. Don't worry about that. You're in the right place. And and where can people find you? Uh, well, I'm a mysterious, you know, ranger of the internets. Uh, but you, you can sure find are. me at uh, thewizardkingsley.com. I was inspired by Miss Brooks's website, and so I made my own. It's Actually, I think it was on this show <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's like, oh, where do people find you? I said, oh, you know, Facebook. Like, not good enough. <laughs> Get a website. Da, da, da. All right. I like that. See, I was of service. Well, um, right. <laughs> wizardly, you know, good yeah, point. I was, exactly. Um, really, 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 really quick, because we've got like one minute. Uh, there's one final chat room question. Can you offer some sage wizardly advice on coping with this pandemic, aside from these courses? Um, what can both non-magical and magical folk do to help metaphysically um it would it be lighting a candle protection you know trying to come out of this fairly unscathed and you got now you got 45 seconds remain (laughs) calm remain focused prepare yourself to be of service and remember above all else the most powerful magic you have is love amen yes All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming up tonight. The hour went by way too fast. We didn't even get to half the stuff, but, you know, you'll come back. But it's always a pleasure to have you visit. I want to thank everybody for listening in as well. And remember, if you're getting cabin fever and need something to keep your mind occupied, go to YouTube, type in Story McCaldron Para X. You can listen to the last show that we did with Nicholas, and you'll find more information. episodes and you can wave a wand at so until next time everybody blessed be stay home be safe and merry meet again good night
Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more Cauldron Stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited.